Hello, my friend, and welcome to the 538th episode of the Sales Podcast. I'm Wes Schaefer, the Sales Whisperer, your host. Today we have returning guest Andy Paul. He came back, um, he first appeared back on 382. Uh, he's back here to discuss his new book, Sell Without Selling Out, A Guide to Success on Your Own Terms. Uh, we get into a lot of cool things. Uh, one that I used as the uh, the second header or the subtitle of the blog post is, you know, he was saying that this is not a kinder, gentler sales process. It's just not offensive. So amen. You know, you can make a lot of sales. You can make a lot of money in sales without being offensive. I've made a lot of money in sales since 1997 by not being offensive. Uh, you can call it kinder, gentler, whatever. It's you're treating people like a human. Um, I think it was Ogilvy, you know, said that the customer is not a moron. She is your wife. So even, you know, 50s and 60s, the Mad Men era, right? Madison Avenue. The smart marketers, the smart advertisers understood that the prospect is not an idiot. It's not somebody to be pushed around. It's not somebody to be belittled or bullied. Okay, find a need and fill it. It's crazy that we have to still discuss this, but we do because humans don't change. We're looking for shortcuts and guys rise up tooting their own horns, promising, you know, the fountain of youth and people fall for it. And it's a lot of gimmicks. So don't fall for it. Okay. Um, Andy, you'll, uh, you'll see he's very calm, very mild mannered. He talks about, you know, his background and how he's not the typical salesperson. Uh, and I share the story, you know, my very first paying sales training client back in 1997 um, was an architect that was going out on his own. And uh, we had a lot of success because selling, professional selling, is very prescriptive. It is scientific. It is color by numbers, if you will. People are very uh, predictable. So if you know what to look for. Uh, you'll know how to respond, you'll know how to engage, to win them over, to gain their trust and help them make the right decision, which hopefully is to go with you. And hopefully, if um, if you're not the ideal solution, you'll tell them that and you'll help them find the right solution. And trust me that you will build up goodwill that will come back with friends if you conduct yourself that way. Okay, uh, if you need some help with that, if you want to <clears throat> tighten things up, you know, I'm offering a one day uh, intensive, you know, private uh, for small businesses. Just did one in early December. Uh, it was great. Um, giving them new scripts, new outlook, new insight into how to how to sell. Okay. And uh, we built a multimedia, multi-step process, included email, included uh, text messaging along with voicemails, along with scripts when speaking with executive assistants and with the decision makers. So very comprehensive. And then we stay in touch and uh, while they test it and uh, help them perfect it. So hit me up if that um, is something you are interested in discussing. And um, if you want to do some on-demand training, check out makeeverysale.com. All right. After you do that, come back and listen to this interview with Andy Paul. Andy Paul is back with his new book, Sell Without Selling Out, A Guide to Success on Your Own Terms. How the heck are you? Wes, I'm doing well. Thank you for having me. Man, this is going to be episode 538, and you were back, uh, you were here on 382, so wow. roughly every 200, right? Is that <laughs> well, Tomorrow, <laughs> we're recording this on the 29th, tomorrow is our... 1000th episode. Nice. How long yeah. have you been doing it? It's uh, six years. Nice. So you, yeah. so you're doing like a couple a week, huh? Yeah, we've, we've cycled from one a week to the last two years. We've been three a week. Oh, wow. Um, so, yeah. When we, when the podcast was acquired by ring DNA, now revenue.io, they wanted to up the frequency. So yeah, we've been doing three a week, which um, that's a job. Interesting. So how, I guess everything's for sale, huh? 
I, if, some, if somebody came to me and offered me some money, I'd probably sell. <laughs> well, it was unexpected. Yeah. I mean, it's, it's yeah, very unexpected. But, you know, a, a great, great archive. And, uh, yeah, I mean, I, certainly for a company from a marketing perspective, uh, it's great SEO content. Um, so, and, uh, yeah, the content was, was good and aligns with what they're doing. So, yeah, we just sort of right place at the right time. Yeah, very cool. Um, so for those that are listening, maybe don't see the video, I have to describe yeah. the glamorous world, because once your podcast gets bought, you, you're given the, these awesome digs, like a fancy office with a view. Absolutely. Yes. Uh, assistants, espresso machines everywhere. Uh, Free massages. Yes. Massage office, chairs, yeah. massages. Yeah. Yep, yep. In your closet. Yeah. In, in my closet. Yes. So. <laughs> Those want to see the, the, that's right. The, the glamour life of podcasting sitting in my closet. Yep. I Normally remember. I'm in my office, but as I mentioned to you, as, as we're recording the, the audio book for my new book this week. And yep. when you live sort of in the middle of a city, in the yep. middle of San Diego, um, on sort of a busy street, you have yep. to find a really quiet place, not just where I'd podcast. And so, yeah, I'm in our, in our closet, which is right in the middle of our, our apartment. Well, I'm, I'm, you know, seven kids and a dog. And oh, yeah, I can understand that. I live on a busy street, but we're up. We're up probably eight, 80 feet or so, but it's still noise. I've got like sound dampeners here, one in one of these windows, but not both. And so I feel your pain. Like I was saying before we hit record, my the first CD I recorded, uh, I had to do it. Um, I, I had sponsored a trade show. And so I was, it was a, a goodie in, a, in the welcome bag, right? Mm -hmm. And so, yeah, back when we still had CDs and could get them for about 67 cents a piece, if you ordered a thousand, uh, <laughs> I, I sat in my closet and I banged it out, had, had yeah. the outline, uh, making good money in bad times. So yeah. still for sale, my friends. Now you can get it as an MP3. Uh, I may have to link to that. I haven't linked to that in a long time. Yeah, I was going to say promote your stuff oh man your yeah show. did it in the closet it's like hey do what you got to do but closets are actually very good places for sound oh yeah there's a lot of i'm speaking into my wife's wardrobe here and so they yeah. have a lot of sound dampening there yeah that's cool hey just get it done huh everybody thinks oh it's like so glamorous blah 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 it's like there's always something to, to get done if you think you're too good then the end is probably near <laughs> yeah well i think podcasting you know, it's a very uh, rarefied group <laughs> that podcasting may be glamorous for <laughs> the ones I listen to perhaps like, yeah, but uh, not, don't think too many sales podcasts. We have that glamorous life. Yeah. Just get it done. So um, yeah, I had you on a couple two and a half years ago and uh, but now you're, you're back again, sell without selling out. Uh, look, man, I hate to break this to you. Mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, I hope this doesn't, doesn't impact sales, but you know, <laughs> we live in the age of transparency. Everybody is authentic. I, I see them on Instagram and TikTok, and they tell me that they're being authentic and real That's and transparent and open. So do we really need your book? Because everybody's transparent now, right? <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, well, that's an interesting form of transparency on social media, right? <laughs> tend to be somebody you're not. And that's that sort of speaks what? to the heart of it is, is yeah, you know, we well, do. What? Are they lying do... to me? Are you what? Those Instagram <laughs> models are not telling me the truth. What? Shocking. Oh, yeah. I may need a moment. I may have to pause and, and take a moment, kind of gather yeah. myself. <sighs> yeah. How's it going? <laughs> um yeah, it's, what, it's one of the themes of the book is is we have this reputation as salespeople as a profession that that on one hand seems unfair, but the other hand is is perhaps not undeserved either. And isn't it time after all these decades of what we consider sort of stereotypically salesy behavior, knowing that they don't work very well why do we still do them let's let's just stop and let's replace those with behaviors that not say gonna call them authentic but i'll say they're they are more innate human behaviors as opposed to these learned behaviors that you know everybody sort of learned what they think being a salesperson is i call these salesy behaviors everybody's learned how to be salesy and that's not what a buyer wants 
I mean, in nowhere can you, you know, ask a question about how I can help the buyer where being salesy is the answer to that question. Uh, mm -hmm. Yeah, is being more salesy going to help you understand your problem better, help me understand, define an outcome for you that you want? Uh, yeah, anything. No. So let's, let's, it's just time, time to stop. Well, you know, I mean, if I can, it's, it's the end of the month and look, if, if I talk to my manager and uh, I might mean, mm. get you another 5% off, but I mean, you're gonna have to place the order by, by tomorrow. So if I can make that, get that done, can we have a deal? Right. I mean, that uh, I'm a that's, professional, that's I'm a professional. I mean, you can trust me. This is how it's done. This is how it's done. And I imagine you've probably been in this situation in your career. I certainly was in numerous times in my career. And at some point you sort of say, well, why? Yeah, if I started this relationship with this buyer by, to your point precisely, by trying to be transparent, trying to be obvious about my motivations there to help. And then you throw it all away by saying, yeah, but what can we do to get you to buy it this month? And yeah, buyers will accept the discounts, but the relationship will never be the same. They'll churn quickly. Uh, and I've never really understood the logic of saying, well, let's, let's give away five to 10, 20 margin points in order to bring a deal in on Friday that we're going to get Monday anyway. I know. And that it's, it makes no sense. And I, and I was put in that situation at one point in my career where working for a CEO that, yeah, he sort of, he got the board accustomed to results every month by sort of bringing orders forward. At some point, the string runs out, and it just makes no sense. Well, it does when you understand how pushy most people are. <laughs> well, it's, they, again, they don't have a process, right? They're just they're winging it, and then it's just yeah. Well, and you're 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 training the customer to yeah. expect it. So yeah. in this particular company, what we did is we stopped training the customers to expect the discounts yeah. and we developed a very predictable flow of revenue that hit our targets and we didn't have to sell our soul to do it. Yeah. Uh, Cause so I've always, it takes, a little, it takes a little bit of courage on the part of a CEO. And I say that courage with a small C. Um, yeah. They got to be willing to say, look, there's a better way to do this. But unfortunately most of them are sort of mainlining last week of the big last week of the month instead of trying to level load what happens. Yeah. Well, you see it so often in that the, like a top performing salesperson gets promoted to management and they, they didn't really have a process. They just hustled. Maybe they had some innate natural ability. Maybe they got mm -hmm. a little bit lucky, uh, but now they're in management and they don't know how to lead. They don't, they didn't really have a process, but now they have to manage others who may not be exactly like them, maybe during a downturn. Uh, and, but I just, I've seen it so often that people just fail up, you know, they, mm -hmm. they'll leave, go to the competition, they'll cross pollinate, they'll get a promotion, but they really weren't, they're just running away from something. Uh, but these become the yeah, bosses. I agree 100%. Yeah. But now they're the bosses and they're, and they're putting their thumb on the, the quota carrying salesperson. Uh, and it's just, um, it's a self-fulfilling prophecy. It's a, a self, what reinforcing uh, scenario. So what's a yeah, poor- well, I mean, And you you nailed it right in the head with the words you use. And I, I talk about this in my new book is, is I distinguish between sales leaders and sales bosses. <laughs> and most people are just bosses. Yeah. To your point is, and, and so oftentimes it's not really their fault because we do so little for managers. When managers, you know, we get these top performers, they get promoted. What do they, who trains them? Who enables them? Who gives them knowledge that they can use to become a leader? Mm -hmm. Oftentimes very little. And so we put these people in very, almost impossible positions to say, in which, yeah, there are a few that will manage to navigate it the same way they manage, manage to navigate being a successful salesperson. But by and large, I think, you know, the single largest point of failure in sales is the fact we don't invest in our managers. So how can we expect our sellers to grow and develop if we're not helping our managers become good leaders? Mm -hmm. 
people always ask, you know, did you get the name from the dog whisperer? And I'm like, yes, I did. As a matter of fact, <laughs> <laughs> I was literally watching an episode and I heard him say he, he rehabilitates dogs and he trains their owners. Mm -hmm. And I was like, I watched I, the show. Yeah. Like I rehabilitate beat down salespeople and train their managers. Cause like most managers haven't had training. Exactly. Um, I mean, if you think about it, we spend LinkedIn in 2018 found a survey that was $15 billion a year spent in the U S on sales training of which let's just say this is maybe even underestimating how much is spent on, but or overestimating how much is spent on sales managers, but let's say 90% of that is spent on training sellers. 10% of that is spent on training managers. I would advocate flipping that percentage. <laughs> I think that you, I don't think you can invest enough in managers to help them understand what it takes to help people grow, how to manage performance. I mean, pro sports have so many lessons to teach us. They've become so sophisticated in how they use data and science to help people improve their performance. And very little of that has bled over into sales. Yeah. Yep. Uh, so what's a poor boy, a poor girl to do? How do they, how do they get Mo better? Cause your book's not out till February. What do they do until then? <laughs> yeah. Download the first chapter. That'll solve everything. Um, <laughs> which we do offer people visit andypaul.com. They can download the first chapter. Well, it's, it's, it's about what I offer in the book is, is four core behaviors that I think that are at the heart of successful selling that are like on the pillars. And I, I said, draw the contrast between these sort of traditional salesy behaviors that, that are very sort of persuasion based and that there's an interesting book. I've read a book by a gentleman named Jonah Berger called the catalyst writing about persuasion. <clears throat> and he says that sites research that shows that as human beings, we instinctively resist being persuaded. And so I find it sort of ironic that we, we spend billions of dollars a year trying to train people to become better at persuasion, which I think, I call sort of selling out as opposed to being more influence oriented. And there's four pillars of what I call selling in, which are connection, curiosity, understanding, and generosity. And that if you can become proficient at those four, building good, solid human connections with, with your buyers, building trust and credibility, deploying your curiosity in the form of asking great questions to goal to reach that level of understanding where you understand what are the most important things for your buyer and how do you help them get that? And then, yeah, use your generosity to help them get the things that are most important to them. You're on the path to success. And, you know, it's, it's, these are innate human behaviors, the ability to want to, the, the need to want to connect with another human being, the need to use your curiosity. The curiosity is how we navigate the world around us. Um, it's how we, you know, survive in the world is our curiosity, understanding you know, that's our basic empathy. We understand other people, why they feel the way they do, how we can help them. And generosity is, is something we do innately because it makes us feel good is to give to other people. And so if we can wisely use our value and, and provide a vision of success for the buyer that they can, they can buy into, then, you know, they're going to get what they want and we get what we want. You know, sort of Zig Ziglar, I think it was said that, you know what, you can get everything you want in the world if you help enough other people get what's important to them. And that's, that's really sort of what drives it. Yeah. Um, yeah, I haven't read that book, but it, it, um, you know, it's interesting. We, cause it's true. If, if I detect somebody's playing a game, even if I want what they're selling, <laughs> like I'll put up a bigger fight just out of principle. <laughs> no, it's in instinct. I mean, Jonah Berger said it's instinct. It's not, it's not principle. It's just, it's the yeah. way we react as humans. Yeah. But especially like being in sales, I love it. Like when I'm buying something, something big, it's happened almost every time I'm going to buy a car and they'll try to make small talk over time and, and you go, Oh, what do you do? And I'm like, I do sales training. <laughs> it's like, <laughs> you know, it's, I don't know. It's like, it's like being at a party and you know, what do you do? Oh, I'm a priest. You're like, Oh, sorry, father, you know, I didn't mean all those jokes I was saying, you know, like, and they'll always go, well, how am I doing? Mm -hmm. <laughs> well, and the thing that's the sort of interest you bring up the car examples is, you know, look at how Tesla is, 
supposedly revolutionizing car sales. But I have a friend who was purchasing a Tesla and she ordered one and had a very specific delivery window. And she was going to be out of town during the delivery window for, she's going to miss it like two weeks. She was going on vacation. And Tesla said, well, I'm sorry. You know, you're going to go in the back of the queue if you're not there to take delivery. We're going to deliver it to the next person on the list. And she's like, but I'm ordering the car. You know, we can, you know, you have my money. And the guy says, well, you know, if you can confirm today. <laughs> ah. So if you actually speak to a person at Tesla and you're having an issue, you're going to get the same pitch you'd get if you walked into a dealership. If we can just finalize that offer today, it won't matter if you're there on the car's ready. We'll hold it for you. Yeah. Well, I've got a Tesla and I ordered a second one. And I mean, the ex buying experience was pretty good. It was, I mean, the first one was two and a half years ago. I literally ordered it on a Sunday while watching my daughter's soccer game, mm -hmm. you know, which was just unbelievable. That was a Saturday, Sunday. Yeah. Now this was before the pandemic and all the other crap that they've thrown at us. But they were like, do you want to pick it up on Tuesday or we'll bring it to you on Wednesday? <laughs> like, oh, okay, yeah, bring it to me. <laughs> yeah, good thing you're at home. If you hadn't been at home, it might have been a different story. Yeah, exactly. Um, but I mean, some of that is positioning, right? Some, some of that is just the market. Like, look, we got something in demand. So, um, well, but in their case, you already paid for it. So, yeah. <laughs> it's like, yeah, yeah, still talk to a person, the same games come out. Yeah. Was, yeah, completely unnecessary. They just could have just said, that's fine. We'll hold it for you. Yeah, which they should have, especially if you already paid for it. Yeah. Um, but it happens, <laughs> unfortunately. Um, I mean, what, what can somebody do, though, if, if they are just a, a quota carrying person and the boss is grinding them down? Uh, I mean, is it, is it time to go? You know, find another job? I mean... Yeah, finding finding a fit is really important, right? I mean, it's yeah. just like product market fit for the product or services you're selling. I mean, there's a fit for all of us as humans. As I talk about in the book, is is in my career, what I did is if I was in a place I enjoyed, but it was getting that sort of, um, I don't say pressure, is is I pushed back. Mm -hmm. Is you have to take control over how you sell. The fact is, no one no one cares about your success as much as you do. So, yeah, your, your bosses can be full of all sorts of advice and direction about what you should do. But if you think it's forcing you into this position I call selling out, then don't do it. Yeah. And yeah, I, in my career is, I was still accountable for results and I was, and I delivered, but I was pretty clear with the bosses that I was going to do things the way I thought worked best for me. Mm -hmm. And I think as sellers, you have that obligation to do that. Otherwise you're going to have a pretty short, unhappy, unsatisfying career. Yeah. And so you have to find a way to work that does a couple of things. One, it aligns with who you are as a human being. Two, it's aligned with how your buyers, what your buyers want you to be is certainly important. Um, and if you can't be those things, then yeah, perhaps it's time to, to look for another situation that's a better fit. And there are, Sales leaders, there are leaders out there that are true leaders that know that their success truly flows from the success of their individuals. Unfortunately, the majority aren't that way yeah. for reasons we talked about. They're just not taught and trained. That this is the way to become a successful leader. Yeah. But you have so to take charge as a seller. It's your career. And at the end of the day, you have to determine for yourself what's the most effective way to utilize your unique strengths to become the best version of yourself. Mm -hmm. So is your book, is it for individual producers? Is it for managers? Is it for both? Well, it's written for the individual contributors, but I've got some portions in there specifically addressed to the leadership. Um, just not to, I don't want to feel completely left out. Right. But I think it's, yeah, it's, it's for individual contributors to say, look, yeah, I want to be in this business. I think I'm pretty good at it, or I could be pretty good at it, but, Something's just not clicking for me. And this is for them, a way for them to understand what those things would be and how they can take themselves really to achieve anything they want to achieve. I mean, I've been incredibly lucky in my career. I'm not 
<laughs> sort of the last last person I think most people that knew me thought would be going into sales. As someone who's pretty introverted. Um, yeah, my first talk about the story in the book, my first sales job out of college, we were working with a big computer company, a company called Burroughs, that's now Unisys, but time was number two computer company in the world. At the end of my first two week sales training course, we were all sent to Pasadena, California from around the country to get trained. The instructor told my boss that they should fire me, that I would never make a good salesperson because I was too analytical. I wasn't salesy enough. <laughs> and that was really sort of the first sort of eye opener to say, well, hmm, yeah, there's got to be a better way than what I saw in that training. And fortunately, I had enough you know, good influences from the other sales sellers in my, my branch office or one of my managers that gave me the freedom to try things and experiment and see what was going to work for a person with my, you know, <laughs> weird personality, I guess, for sales. And it, it worked. But it, you always sort of, you know, the flip side of that is you can go along. You can go along with what everybody else is doing. It may or may not work for you. If you say, look, I'm going to take charge of my career and I'm going to be more intentional about how I grow and develop, you're taking a little bit more risk because you're sort of saying, look, yeah, I'm not going to be doing just like everybody else, perhaps, but I'm going to be a little more exposed, but I'm going to deliver. I'm going to be held accountable for the results. And yeah, you'll feel much more empowered to deliver those results when you feel more aligned in how you're selling. Yeah. You know, it's interesting. I, I tell people all the time that sales is, is extremely predictable it, it's it's very process oriented it's more scientific than people understand they think oh you got the gift of gab oh you've never met a stranger oh you should be in sales you could sell ice cream to an eskimo but when i try to explain to people it's like look it's people leave clues they they tell you how they want to buy if you'll pay mm. attention absolutely you know if you'll adapt yourself your selling style to match their buying preference, it can get so much easier. And, and I tell people, my very first paying sales training client like 14 years ago was an architect that was leaving the firm and going out on his own, mm -hmm. right? And he did very well because he was very process oriented and I gave him a process to follow. And, uh, but I think, like natural salespeople, if you will, right? The outgoing, gregarious, predictable type, you know, that you, we envision. Um, a lot of times, like we push back on the process. Uh, like I, mm -hmm. it took me a while to really internalize it because I was just good on my feet and happy-go-lucky and just win people over and hustle and get it done. And I got older, like, man, I'm tired. <laughs> Is there a better way? <laughs> oh, a system. Oh, okay. <laughs> yeah. Well, but your the key words, I think what you're talking about is, is you have to react to the buyer. You got to be adaptable. Um, you have to listen, pay attention. I, I am on record saying I learn more about sales from my customers than any other source in my, my career. If you listen to your point precisely, they'll tell you how to sell to them. But you got to pay attention. Yeah, you, know, you got to find out and ask the questions. Be really curious about, yeah, what is really, what's driving them? What's really important to them? Right. Instead of so many sellers today, they got their playbook, they got their set list of questions. I'm going to ask these questions and you're going to gather some information, but you're maybe missing the most important point of all, which is, yeah, what's really driving the change? Mm -hmm. Yeah, you've got list answers to all your questions, but you don't really know anything. Mm -hmm. So can how can we be prescriptive and, and follow a process, but make it feel conversational and natural? All right. Because if I just show up, hello, Andy, Paul, I am Wes. I am here. I have 37 questions I will ask you. And if you answer them honestly, then I can give you a good recommendation that will probably help you meet your needs. May we begin? I mean, so. <laughs> well, that's, that's what a lot of people would love to see happen. I mean, right. A lot of people love to, get the salespeople out of the middle of the whole equation. Yeah, well, but a lot if of you, places are doing that. Sure. Well, to some degree, but 
think about why do why do buyers even agree to talk to a a salesperson? Because they need to. Because they need to, right? They they need some information, some insight, something that they can't get by themselves by themselves Mm -hmm. through their online research. So in that moment, are you prepared to be a, a more valuable source of of insight and and value for them than what they can find online? Mm-hmm. It's a pretty low bar to surmount. So one is, you know, you start with that, to your point, is you start with, you know, you have lots of sales managers these days telling sellers, look, buyers don't have time for small talk, just jump right into business, just like, it's like they're trying to defy sort of the, the laws of, of uh, physics for relationships and the way people connect. And mm-hmm. as you know, you got to find some common ground to start building a connection with this, this person in order to open the possibility of establishing your credibility and building some trust with them. So that personal thing is, is really critical. You have to be interested in them more than yourself. You know, if you're just asking these, to your point, these robotic questions, they know you're not interested. So are you in the moment? Are you being intentional? Are you listening to what they're saying? Are you alive to the possibility of asking a great follow-up question that's going to open the door to further insight into what's really important to the buyer, what's really driving their, their desire to change or what's driving their desire to achieve a certain outcome. It's just, you know, these are basic human, human skills. Is there, is the close dead? Well, is there ever, (laughs) I I like to ask people the question, you know, in business to business sales is how often have you been in the room when the customer makes the decision? Now I, I can tell you from my experience of, you know, traveling the world, selling on six continents and selling hundreds of millions of dollars worth of stuff that I was never in the room when they made their decision. So we shaped, helped shape the decision. But yeah, this idea of the close, I think really depends on your definition of what you're talking about. I mean, I think the, the closer, well, so many people envision it as, is a myth. In a, in a complex sale, you're mm-hmm. right you know, we're going to meet, we're going to present, blah, blah, blah. They're going to go back and pontificate and ruminate. Uh, But like I use an example, a lot of times on the show of a chiropractor, you know, uh, I come in, I get my first exam is free or whatever, includes an x-ray, blah, blah, blah. Now he's got a package, Mm -hmm. you know, my my jujitsu school, you know, you can come in and roll for free once. And then, you know, there's you can come back later but you know ideally you sign up after that or if i'm selling solar for, you know what door-to-door landscaping you know it, sometimes the the person's present yeah um, well i was talking about business to business sales right i mean it's, sure. it's it's exceedingly rare in that case business to business sure i mean business to consumer sure i mean it's it's much more Certainly when you're buying a car, I mean, you're, you're there. Um, yeah, I had a client that was a big uh, nationwide installer of residential solar systems. I mean, yeah, those were big, somewhat complex sales that, that oftentimes there was an element of the close, so to speak on it. But, you know, in my book, I address primarily business to business and it's, you got, you know, I find interesting is, is, even today, you still see it. And you see in job descriptions for open sales positions, you know, they advertise these, these four recruit for these qualities that you wonder, what are they thinking? Right. I want a hunter. I want a closer. I want an extrovert. I'm, and I always ask these people, I said, so if they're clients, it's like, okay, so how do any of these things help the buyer make a better, faster decision? And they don't, Yeah, you know, how does, how does being more salesy help the buyer achieve what they want to achieve? And the answer is it doesn't help them at all. How does it help the seller? It doesn't help the seller at all. So part of what I advocate in the book is, is yeah, it's time to just stop those behaviors and let's replace them with something that works for you as well as the buyer. Are B2B sales happening via chat and text? You know, have you seen big deals close without people getting on the phone or meeting face to face? 
not entirely that I've seen, but certainly it's, it's, those things are more in the mix for sure. Mm -hmm. Um, the same principles I assume still apply. Yeah. Right. I mean, well, yeah. All right. So I, I started my career long, long time ago and 600 years or so ago. And well, I talked about poor, I you know, spent years traveling the globe, selling international customers, seven, eight, nine figure deals. And yeah, I might travel, go see them twice, maybe face to face and closing yeah. a 10 or $20 million deal. I mean, most of it was done remotely. Yeah. And so, yeah, you've always had to, I think certainly at companies I work for, we were startups. We didn't, we had the constraint of no money, so we couldn't travel extensively. So you have mm -hmm. to operate within the constraints and that forces be more creative about how we worked with the customer remotely in order to help them move forward in the deal. It was all carrier pigeons and fax machines, huh? There were some faxes involved. <laughs> I, won't, I won't deny. I remember as a kid, uh, when faxes were relatively new, we, my dad was uh, sent to Japan on business. And so we were living in Tokyo at the time. And remember when a fax would come in from the home office, you know, such, considered such a big deal. You know, he'd, he'd get dressed and go to the office in the middle of the night to, <laughs> to, to receive. Oh my gosh. It. It's like, eh, interesting. Things change how, quickly. How did he know there was a fax there that they call him and say, go to the office and get the fax? There, they told him ahead of time, yeah, we're going to be sending you a fax tonight. It's like, I think the technology, I don't, I can only speculate because I was younger, but maybe the technology was considered still unreliable that had to be sure that got there. Um, well, I, we were faxing deals in 90, oh, 98, 99, sure. 2000. I was faxing deals. Well, by that time, though, email was starting to come in, too. Yeah, yeah. But yeah, email was, was there, but we still did faxes. It was still pretty limited, though, compared to what you could have to do today with it. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I didn't get a cell phone until early 2000. Oh, really? Yeah. Well, I've got the same. I guess I was an early adopter. I got the same same phone number since 1989. Oh, my gosh. Yeah. So, but I remember I got that phone because I was recruited to come to San Diego to be VP of sales for a startup and CEO said, Hey, you know, we're giving away cell phones or the executives cell phone. Great. Um, and so I was, it didn't last long because I was, uh, we were selling a lot overseas. So on the way into work, I was calling customers in Europe mm. to commute down interstate yeah, thousand dollar phone bill. Yeah. And on the way home, I was calling customers in Asia and mm. after about two months, he said, yeah, <laughs> let's call from the office. Mm -hmm. And let's be honest, that wasn't really a cell phone. That was like a briefcase with. Oh, this one was actually as small as one of the first flip phones. It was, oh. it was, pretty, it was pretty cool. Oh. It's pretty cool. But uh, yeah, it was very expensive. <laughs> well, we closed a lot of deals. So hey. I was making use of every second of time I had. Tell the boss to look at the ROI, huh? Yeah, I don't think he was convinced, but whatever. <laughs> but you think about the way, you know, technology sort of marched. I saw this story the other day is, again, I've been around a long time. And, and when I first started doing international business, you'd leave the offices is, yeah, the only way to get hold of you really is faxes because, you know, they could, they weren't going to call and leave a voicemail at the hotel. And you had to use these special AT&T inbound dialing services to connect back to the U.S. So it didn't cost an arm and a leg. And. And it sort of felt like almost like a little bit of vacation when mm -hmm. you, and then by the time I stopped doing heavy international travel, you know, 2000 with email and everything else, it was a 24 hour day job. You never, you yep. never off. Yep. Yep. So what's the role of follow-up then in this kinder, gentler world? You know, if I'm not going to be salesy and I'm, I'm connected. I'm curious. I'm generous. I answer your questions. I don't push. Well, it's I, not that you don't push. You're you give with an agenda. I mean, you have to be very specific with the buyer that that you're gonna you're gonna succeed because they're gonna only because they're gonna succeed, right? And right. Adam Grant talks about in his book, Givers and Takers. It was the most effective in his you know, he stack ranks givers, matchers, and takers. So, you know, takers that you know, all out for themselves, matchers that match how much they give with how much they take, givers, giving. But I said, you know, the most productive employees are givers 
I call them givers with an agenda, right? Is, is I, I am here to help you succeed because I can only succeed if you succeed. And so, yeah, as you, just because you're, it's not kinder or gentler, it's just not offensive. <laughs> so you're, working, you're working with the buyer to help them do one of the most important things that they want to do is when a buyer sets out to make a decision, let's say, look, we need to make a change. This is a problem. What they want to do is they want to quickly gather and make sense of the information they need to make a decision with the least investment of their time and attention possible. Not just that's your job as a seller. You're going to fit the other half of that. So how are you going to help them effectively move through this process of understanding what their problems are and what the, what's the most important thing that they want to achieve? help them understand how they can do this in a way that enables them to achieve the goals that they've set out for them. Mm -hmm. And if you can do that in as expeditious a fashion, fashion as possible, they'd prefer that. Yeah. So it's not about, I said, it's not about being laid back. It's almost just the opposite, but you're doing it openly. You're doing it transparently. You're letting your motivations be out there in front of them. I'm here to help you. And I think we can get this done. In this time frame, here's our mutual action plan. They sign up for it, off you go. Yeah. And so I've written about this in earlier books is, you know, sellers fall into this way of behaving. They think that, oh, I'll send the customer this document today. I'm gonna give them three days to read it and then we'll you know, get back in touch with them. It's like, why? It doesn't take them that long to read it. Lay it all out for them. Here's the plan. Not if they're motivated, right? Right, here's the plan. Mm-hmm. Customers know you have, they've got a plan and you're following through and you're providing the value and you're giving them painting this vision of what success is going to be like when they achieve their most important goal. That's what they want. Yep. Uh, what was the name of the book you just mentioned? Uh, well, Adam Grant's book was Give and Take. Give and Take. Okay. Um, a great book. People should really, I mean, it's got a ton of sales examples in there. Um, but this idea that you know, there's a whole segment of quote unquote sales experts say, eh, you can't be a giver. If you're a giver in their mind, that's just a seller that just, you know, unrestrained giving, I'm just gonna give you everything I possibly can and hope that something sticks. And that's sure. You don't want to do that. Yeah. But you do want to give. What's that? It's part of, part of a plan. And Hey, Here's our agenda. Let me open about my agenda. This is what we're trying to accomplish. I only succeed if you succeed. How can I help you get the thing that's most important to you? And if I can do that, then I win. You win. Yeah. So what happens if, you know, you, you do this, you, you follow the steps, um, you do everything right, but they're still kind of standoffish. Is it just you win some, you lose some? Is it just maybe they've been burned in the past and they're just reluctant to really open up? You know, is there something can can you turn anybody around if you just are persistent and professional? And well, why would you want to spend that much time? Because I've I, got a quota, man. My boss is breathing down my right. neck. So I had that problem. I posed that question to my first boss very early in my career, and he said, "Well, I've got a a theory I call or a rule." He said, "It's the big world rule." And he says, it's a really big world out there. Go find a prospect that wants to buy from you. And he's right. I mean, it's not, I see sellers get wrapped around the axle trying to turn somebody around who was, A, they didn't do great discovery and qualification on the first place. They shouldn't be investing additional time on that prospect. We talked about fit early on. Is fit is really important, right? Is you need to find buyers that fit and are prepared to move forward. And, you know, I think it's, it, I forget what the exact number is. It, it's a range actually of deals in B2B world that end up in no decisions, mm -hmm. which is sort of the worst of all possible world. And they're doing sellers trying to do just what you talked about, trying to turn around somebody that's just not prepared and ready to buy at that time. Fine. Yeah. Come back to them later. Go find somebody who is ready. Yeah. There's never been a situation where, and I've dealt in businesses like spent a good chunk of my career in the satellite communications business. And for the products we were selling, we had like 200 prospects in the entire world. Mm. And yet we were never short of opportunities. Mm -hmm. Are there signs? Can you tell like if you're being jerked around or if they're just a tire kicker, 
you know, yeah. there's signs like, Hey, I gotta, I gotta cut bait. Cause this, this is going nowhere. Yeah. Well, again, if they're not going to commit to a, a mutual action plan for moving forward, then yeah, that's, that's one sign for sure. There are signs at various points of the, the process. One of the big ones in qualification is if, yeah, if the, if the buyer never does their internal business case, meaning if they haven't quantified the impact of what making the investment in your product or service will do for them, then chances are they're just not ready to move forward at that point in time. Mm -hmm. You can help them with that. Maybe the, they don't have a resource, but chances are they just haven't, you haven't really identified what's most important to them. You really haven't identified what's the key to get them to move forward. Right. Until you do that, they're not going to be ready. And they're not going to tell you oftentimes. You have to, <laughs> that's the thing that sellers seem to think is that the buyers will tell them. Well, that presumes that they've, I really understand it themselves. And the role as a seller, oftentimes, is to help the buyer understand the problems they're trying to solve, the depth and the breadth and uh, all the potential opportunities that may exist for solving it. Yeah, a lot of times they don't know. I tell my clients all the time, you know, my, my members in sales training, that if the prospect truly understood the ramifications of their issue, they would have already solved it. Yeah, they wouldn't need to talk to you about it. Yeah, so they're kind of meandering around and we've got to help them bubble it up mm -hmm. really understand it themselves. Well, right. And if you're the seller who can do that, if you can, like I said, unleash your curiosity, ask some great questions, help the customer really begin to understand, reach that level of understanding of, of yeah, what the magnitude of the problem is and what the magnitude of the opportunity is for solving it. You're going to differentiate yourself mm -hmm. because most sellers just, you know, they regress to the mean, which is they're going to be somewhat robotic as you started off early on the conversation. Going to be robotic in terms of how they pursue the opportunity, the questions they ask, sort of superficial level of interest, really in the buyer. Mm -hmm. That gives you a chance. That's your opportunity. So that's for me, that was always what I seized is, yeah, yeah. Was I too analytical? Yeah, perhaps. But that tendency to be a little more analytical helped me out compete the companies I was competing against because I could get to a depth of understanding of the buyer, which in turn helped the buyer achieve a depth of understanding of what the opportunity was for them to solve the problem. Mm -hmm. that they didn't get from anybody else. Mm -hmm. So I won deals, you know, you'd ask us to do a post deal analysis with the customer, you know, what set us apart? Why'd you make the decision? And it was not unusual to hear the customer say, because you guys understood us in a way that no one else did. Make the customer feel understood. Huge source of value. And is that by like feeding it back to them? Like, well, you eventually you're going to do that, but it's by continuing to dig, right? Just, right. you know, listen to recorded phone calls of, or phone call recordings of reps doing a discovery call and they'll ask a question and then not ask a follow-up question. Mm -hmm. You can tell when the customer's sort of leading, right? something else you want that's there that you can surface. Oh, that's real interesting. Tell me more about that. Or, Hey, what else can you tell me about that? And just ask that several times, keep digging, digging. And then, okay, let me just repeat back to you. what I think I just heard. And they say, yeah, I think that's it. And then you've just to make sure you always ask the question. Mm -hmm. Okay. So what are we missing? Just when you've confirmed it, when you think you've confirmed it, the buyer ask, well, what are we missing? Mm -hmm. Oh, well then they think about some more. And you do this on these critical issues that you've surfaced. And again, you're gaining, you're gaining an understanding of the buyer and the buyer is gaining understanding of themselves. But there's not, that experience with you is differentiated from the experience they have with any other seller. That counts towards something. Mm -hmm. You always say, prove you're different by being different. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> and the way to do it is to keep, keep digging, be curious, make sure you understand and then you take that understanding and you, you paint this picture for the buyer. What's success going to look like? What's success going to look like? You keep iterating that. You know, I tell people that, you know, yes, we want to tell stories, but the fact is there's really only one story the buyer is really interested in, and that's their own story. Mm -hmm. So help them create that story. Yep. Does this work on like a hard charger? You know, prospects coming in, driving a hard bargain. You know, maybe you call you know, a bluebird, right? Hey, whoa, this guy calls, he's ready to buy, but, you know, he's trying to dictate terms, maybe wait until the end of the month, end of the quarter. Um, 
can you soften them up with this? Can you slow play it, push it to the next quarter? Or can you, can you get them to well, soften again, up and, and pay full the, price? <laughs> well, it's about what's doing what's right for the buyer ultimately, right? And in some cases, yeah, slowing up is the right thing to do with the buyer. Because they don't, they don't understand. Yeah, let's get a price. I mean, I've had that happen with buyers. I think, yeah, let's play the salesperson's game. We'll get interest on last week of the month and we'll contact them. Yeah, Bluebirds come in. I don't know. I mean, I've had some great successes off Bluebirds, but I had more of those that just weren't worth our time. Yeah, for sure. So, I mean, as a seller, you have an obligation to develop your own business acumen along the way and through your career. And, and, <sighs> Yeah, if you're not constantly adapting, as you talked about, keeping your eyes open, learning from every situation you're in, applying that learning going forward. Yeah, you may get sucked into some of those situations. Yeah. Yep. You can tee them up, knock them back gently, warm them up, win them over, especially if they've got your book, right? Sell without selling out. Especially if they have my book, yes. So without selling out a guide to success on your own terms. So I am, I'm linking to that. It's on your website. Um, I'm linking as well to episode 382. We discussed your other book and some timeless wisdom there. So um, <laughs> thank you. Thank it's you. all good, man. Anything I should have asked? Anything we missed? No, no. Great discussion. Thank you. All right. I know you've got an audio book to record. Yeah, well, that's right. Next uh, four days, I got to keep on chugging. It's Oh, my gosh. So how long does that take? Uh, how many it's hours eight, per day? Eight to 10 hours. To oh, record. my gosh. Of just steady reading. Yeah, and it's it's feels almost like, a little bit like a performance, which is kind of fun. For sure. And so there's a producer on you know, the other end of the line who's who's. Oh, saying okay let's uh let's let's reread that try something different almost like a oh, almost like a, a director on a, a performance so there's um obviously an app something you connect to and you know can they can hear you or... yeah yeah they've got something they've used i've i think it's specifically for this i've sure. i hadn't heard of it before but right. yeah i mean it's sort of like a zoom or a riverside that we talked about but sure yeah they're That's listening cool. and i think they have more fine control over the the recording and the uh, the editing so right you know because they have to time mark it really quickly if i have to redo a line a specific line in a yeah, paragraph yeah. or whatever and the guy does it very quickly but sure. yeah, it's kind of nice to do that where get instantaneous feedback about yeah. okay that was great uh, let's try that again it seemed like you're a little rushed and uh, so yeah yeah it's, they it's allow nice to... you to ad lib and sprinkle in some bonuses in there or is it got to be like by the book <laughs> yeah by we're going by the book yeah so that's that's the one the publisher wants us to do so um <laughs> so we made a few changes from the print book just in order to accommodate reading it so and narrating it so sure. you know in some cases we say well we have a chart that we have to refer to you know right right go to my website to see this chart or you know as you read on yeah, you know, as you listen on so a few small changes and transitions but otherwise it's very true to the book and you gotta give like a shout out to the sales whisperer here and there i mean look they, they need to give uh, you every some, other page yes they need to give you some uh some freedom okay some creative freedom there <laughs> exactly exactly <laughs> All right. Well, good luck with that. I'll let you get back to it. All right, Andy Wes, Paul, thank you very much. From his closet, man, hitting a home run. Thanks for coming on the show. Hey, thanks for having me. One salesy action can ruin the entire relationship. Think about that in terms of dating. I've always equated sales with courtship because it is a courtship. Um, but if the guy does one pushy thing, one uh, inappropriate thing. If he's too aggressive, too soon, it doesn't matter how many hours or days or weeks or months, you know, one inappropriate act can, can ruin the whole relationship. You know, weddings have been called off, engagements called off, regular dating has been ended by being desperate, by being pushy, by being needy, by being too aggressive, by being offensive. So you need to understand how you are perceived. You know, we as the sales people, as the sales professionals must 
adapt and change how we sell to match how the prospect wants to buy. And the prospect will tell us how they want to buy. We just pay attention. I've been diving into uh, Tim Van Milligan's book. He's coming up on episode 542. Uh, and he's got some interesting insights in, um, in the four personality types. And uh, I've been taking notes. And um, it's quite different, quite enlightening. But the main thing is people are predictable. Uh, you've got to just pay attention and see. And then you'll know how to conduct yourself. Uh, so, you know, Andy's book, uh, I'm linking to it uh, on the website, uh, Sell Without Selling Out, A Guide to Success on Your Own Terms. Um, so figure out how to not be offensive, okay? We talk about having an agenda. Uh, I've always had a free tool, uh, thesalesagenda.com. Get the uh, exact agenda I have followed and used since 2006 uh, to sell more. I've done it at big companies like Google. I've done it with individual prospects. Uh, I've done it in high tech. I've done it in healthcare. I've done it in financial services. So it, it works. Okay, the salesagenda.com. Get yourself that that free tool and uh, let me know if I can help. All right. Thanks for listening. I'll go sell something.